Hello and welcome back to Who Books That with Harrison Greenbaum. I'm your host, Harrison Greenbaum. Uh, I took a little two week hiatus, um, but we are back and man, I'm so excited about our guest tonight. Um, but before we get to our main event, uh, a couple of quick things of housekeeping. Um, this show is presented by the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Uh, they have been incredibly supportive uh, for the entire show. We're on episode 27, which is insane. Um, but you can join the IBM or renew your membership at magician.org slash join dash the dash IBM slash join. It's a fantastic organization. They've been doing incredible stuff during this uh, pandemic and also incredible stuff when it's not a pandemic. So make sure you join them. There's the link below. And this show is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. if you are on the East Coast, 4 p.m. if you're on the West Coast. And if for some reason you're in the middle, it's uh, 5 p.m. I think so. That sounds about right. Maybe it's 6 p.m. It's 6 p.m. if you're Central Time. I went to a very good school and I can't do basic math. Okay. But if you would like to download this as a podcast, because this show is always available as a podcast, you just go to whobooksthat.com. You can click the link. It's available on Apple Music. It's available on Google Play. Uh, it's available on all sorts of uh, places where you get your podcasts. It is one of the top 100 performing arts podcasts in six different countries. We added Australia. So good day, mate. Thank you for, for listening. I, I love you and the kangaroos. And, and the support of this show. So thank you so much to all the people who are listening down under. Um, you can download this as a podcast and please leave a five-star review. That is always very helpful. And of course, you can follow me at Harrison Com Comedy on the Twitter and Instagram. But now on to the main event, our featured guest for tonight. I am so excited. He is the millionaire's magician himself. His show Chamber Magic uh, just celebrated its 20th year anniversary. He's done over five thousands performances. He's performed for Kings and Queens. He's been on television. He's been on Letterman. He had his own show on the History Channel. He is a fantastic performer. He's a pre fantastic presenter. Um, he's just an all around great guy. Uh, and he also went to Magic Camp. Uh, I love this guy. I know you're going to love him. Make some noise. Get excited. From your apartment or home, it's Steve Cohen, everybody. Shalom, Steve. Shalom. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks to make me feel very comfortable. That's a wonderful welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it's nice. You know, I feel like Houdini had to change his last name, but we're uh, we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, there's a great saying. I think it was from um, I don't remember. It was anyway. The, the point being, I want to make it as Steve Cohen, or I'm not going to make it at all. Yes, that's what happened with my dad. My dad was like, "We didn't survive the Holocaust for you to change your name. You better <laughs> be Greenbaum." And so now I don't fit on any uh, billboards. Anytime I got a comedy club, they have to use all the letter space they have. Exactly. There's no comparison to Harrison. Well, before you were the millionaire's magician, uh, you grew up in Westchester County. I found this photo of you as a kid. Uh, I don't think this is your tractor, but I'd love to know what's going on. Oh uh, I think that's you yeah, that's uh, on the farm. Yeah, that was not my farm. So in, when I was in, <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Westchester. That picture was taken in Wisconsin um, in a town called Viroqua, Wisconsin. And um, that the boy with the tank top um that was his farm and the little girl who's there it's, it's her parents farm as well um they were my pen pals in second grade and you know this is back in the days when people used to just send letters to each other my second grade teacher mrs tormy uh told us that we had to write to some strange you know random person from a different town so my pen pal was paired up with some kid from a farm which is as far as you could possibly imagine from Growing up in rural, I mean, in, uh, in in a suburb of west of New York City, and so so anyway, my parents drove us out to Wisconsin one summer <laughs> and said, "You're going to meet your pen pal." That's so that was, incredible. Yeah, that was, that's Matthew Beckadal, who's my I haven't kept track of, of him, and um, and his sister Angie Beckadal. I always remember their names, um, and they they had a farm, and my brother and I, the other kid that was there, was my brother. Um, yeah, we just ran around like you know two city kids in a, uh, in a farm environment. We had no idea what we were doing. And by the way, I feel, I feel very underdressed and, and, and under with an underwhelming apartment compared to uh, the splendor behind you. Um, is there anything you can do to help me out? Oh, um, you mean you want to make your place fancy? Yeah. Okay. Now I'm not anywhere near you. I'm actually at my hotel right now. Um, but how can I do this? Maybe. Oh, I got an idea. How about this? Alexa show lighting. Are you trying to shop for lighting? Oh, wait. No, I think she got it. There we go. She got it. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. I tried to make it work. I really did. It, it Are you trying to shop for lighting? No, I'm not, Alexa. Stop ruining the bit. 
All right. Um, but let's go through. So you have, I mean, a lot of magicians start off young, but you have a great uncle. And uh, I hear he uh, had a very interesting way of teaching you magic as a kid. Yeah. So my uncle was an amateur magician. He was born in 1901. Um, so he grew up in the New York area and um, always used to go to all the old magic shops. I think he went to Martinka's. And point being, he used to carry lots of pocket tricks. You know, back in the day, they didn't call close-up magic, close-up magic. It was called pocket tricks. And if you look in the old magic catalogs, you'll see there's a whole cat category called pocket tricks. So my uncle used to carry various tricks, you know, the color changing knives and the shell coins, all sorts of gimmick gimmicky things. Did he and, actually uh, give you those color changing knives? Cause you were a kid yeah. that feels like a very dangerous thing for it somebody. Is, yeah, he gave me, a child. At the age of six, he gave me, this is the seventies, Harrison, come on. <laughs> <laughs> He Let had to use those know. knives and cigarettes. He said, get yeah. to work. Exactly. No <laughs> kidding. Um, so basically he said, look, if you learn the trick, and he taught me the trick, if you learn this trick, then I'll teach you the next time we meet up another trick. So he kind of strung me along. I had to actually perform it for him and show him that I wasn't just learning the secrets for my own purpose, but I went, he wanted me to actually become a presenter, a performer of magic. And so if I could prove to him that I knew it, then he'd teach me the next one. So the way I always like to put it is that he's kind of like a drug dealer, you know, <laughs> right. kind of yeah. along one at a time. But the he other part that first little taste and then he makes you work for the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, for some reason, all the magic tricks I found on street corners. Um, but <laughs> but the, the, the best part was that, you know, growing up and this is not the best part for health, but the best part for me as a, as a grow, as a budding magician was that everyone in my family was a cigarette smoker. So whenever I went to family parties, there was always like a billow of smoke that was just, the room was just filled with smoke. And so if my uncle took a coin and he made the coin disappear, to me as a little boy, it looked like it disappeared into a puff of smoke. <laughs> so that was, it just, that was what triggered me in my mind of trying to make magic look real. And uh, I guess it was, you know, as I was learning magic, I was probably getting lung cancer, but the fact <laughs> is that, you know, that was part of me wanting to become a magician is the whole smoke atmosphere. No, it's amazing. And and uh, so you always knew you loved magic, even from six. Did you know at that point, I'm going to be a full-time magician? Was that always the dream? Or was there any other, was there anything else you could have seen yourself doing? Well, you know, I mean, I think as you mentioned before about, you know, the name Cohen being Jewish, <laughs> I don't think there's any Jewish parents that dream of their young child becoming a master magician. That's, you know, usually it's either a doctor or a lawyer, right, going into some profession. And so I always say that, you know, my parents wanted a physician, but they got a magician. That's right. <laughs> uh, so the point being that, you know, I've done pretty well for myself. So they're still pretty proud. You know, you went to Cornell, which was my safety school. So that's like amazing. Uh... <laughs> okay, wait, 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 time out, time out right there. You know, Harrison, that if you go into the campus store at Cornell, they sell t-shirts with the Harvard logo on it. And it says Harvard because not everyone can get into Cornell. <laughs> did you go to the hockey games, by the way? Because those were, uh, did you ever see the, the fish throwing? I never, I maybe went to one hockey game when I was in, in Ithaca. I never went, I, that wasn't my sport. So now tell me about the fish throwing. Oh no, the Harvard Cornell hockey game, at least when I was an undergrad, um, the tradition was you would throw fish onto the ice, which both sides didn't want. Neither teams wanted us to do this. Um, because it would interrupt the games. They would have to go on and clear the fish from the ice. And I remember by my senior year, you had to be real, 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 you had to just hide under a jacket, but it was a giant fish, so it smelled like fish. So they were like metal detecting us, but the metal detector doesn't pick up fish. So I just remember my roommates being like, you're the magician, you can get this fish in. And I was like, I'm not using my powers for that. Exactly, you're bringing in some, some gummy Swedish fish. Right. <laughs> you gum up their blades. And you went straight from Cornell to Japan, right? Right. So basically, I always wanted to move to Japan. But as, I, as it turns out, um, my, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, uh, was a grad student at Cornell. And she's a native Japanese uh, citizen. So we actually went back to Japan together right after I graduated from school and got married uh, in Japan with my wife. Wow. And did you always, how did you know you loved Japan? Like, was it, was it, was there something that sparked your love for it? Was there something you had seen or what attracted you to that country in particular? Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I sometimes try to think back to what was it because, you know, you always find these little parts of your youth that there's maybe like one little moment 
that that makes a trigger and you can't even really trace back unless you have psychotherapy. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 there were probably a couple of reasons. One of them was, I, and this is kind of an embarrassing reason, but I saw a Steven Seagal movie um, where he was painting some Japanese calligraphy. <laughs> and I was like, Here, here's a non-Japanese, like a white guy who's painting Japanese calligraphy. I thought that was pretty cool that someone could do that. And then, um, what else? Oh, then I saw Max Maven uh, speaking Japanese, and I thought that was really impressive. Because here's a, someone who's in my field, someone who's you know can do magic and mentalism, and he can speak Japanese also. And then when I went to Japan, uh, right after graduating from high school, uh, I met a guy named Joe Palermo, who was a, an American who was interested in magic, not a magician, but he's very interested in magic. And I heard him speaking fluent Japanese uh, in Tokyo while I was there. And that just blew my mind. And I thought, <laughs> here's a guy who does not look like he should be able to speak Japanese and he speaks it like a native. So that kind of inspired me. So when I went back to college and at Cornell, uh, I started taking Japanese 101, then 201. Then my junior year, I actually went to Tokyo and lived there for a year um, and, uh, and worked at Tono Nosaka's Magic Land, the magic shop, uh, which was really great. Actually, now that I think about it, there's one more spark early on. Um, when I was 17, uh, I won the uh, International Brotherhood of Magicians, the sponsor of this, uh, this broadcast. I won the IBM Junior Competition for Close-Up Magic. And one of the judges uh, was a very well-known magician named Shigeo Takagi. And Shigeo Takagi saw me and he said to me in his broken English, you come Japan. <laughs> and that was to me like uh, the three most important words because it actually was my entree to coming to actually making the big trip to Japan. He invited me to perform there at a magic convention the following summer. So this is like, you know, as a 17 year old kid, it was just mind blowing that I was invited to another country. Turns out that the Japanese economy was in the bubble economy at the time. And they were inviting over lots of foreign magicians to introduce the Western style of magic to the Japanese magicians. And that the, the Japanese way of teaching, I feel like there's a lot more sort of apprenticeship. There's more of official. Did you find that was a totally different way of mentoring and bringing up the, the young magicians? Um, yeah, I think there's there, that's certainly part of it. There, you know, traditionally there's a there's a you know a mentor mentee sort of relationship there. But that that goes for all of Japanese society. There is always the senpai kohai um, relationship, which is where like you have the seniors and the the juniors in any organization, and the juniors always look up to the seniors. Uh, to learn and 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 really, you know, our, our the beck and call of the seniors will do whatever they're told to do. Um, so, so I think that happens also in the magic community. But I also I thought that one of the beautiful things about Japanese magic is that there's a daintiness to it because there's a daintiness to Japanese culture in general. So, you know, for instance, you might have ever, you might have seen the Japanese tea ceremony where the um, you know the green tea matcha is made and whisked together. And you know, any time that any object is picked up, like I've been holding this handkerchief, any time an object is picked up, it's always picked up in precisely the same way. And if a handkerchief was going to be lifted and, and removed, it was always opened in precisely the same fashion and stroked the same way. And if you had the, the chopsticks, your hands were stroking around them in the same perimeter every time. And I think that that actually ties into the way that Japanese magicians approach their magic. There's a precision that is really just part of the culture and it bleeds into the magic that they perform. So I, I was really impressed by that. And it, I think that also is very present in your work too. Like there's there's a very, there's an intentionality with everything you do. I mean, I know in, in Win the Crowd, you talk about your how you practice and part of your practice involves closing your eyes and doing things by muscle memory. Is that some a little bit informed by that sort of Japanese training? Um, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, I think that that I actually got that idea, though, of of training with my eyes closed from uh, Magic Camp when when I was a student at Magic Camp. Is that Vito Lupo? No, it was actually I remember I learned it from Johnny Ace Palmer, ah. uh, one of my uh, great inspirations when I was growing up and a great inspiration now. I think he's a fantastic uh, magician and, and uh, just all around sensational human being. So um, we haven't yeah. stayed in touch that much. And I feel bad for that. But um I have such respect for Johnny Ace Palmer. And he taught that uh, to all of his students, which is that if you wanted to 
there's probably, yeah, there's a picture of me at magic camp. Um, if you want to practice uh, an act or any sort of magic, one of the things you can do is you can practice it without the props. You can practice it with, um, with, uh, with your eyes closed and using the props. And one of them is just uh, keeping your body completely still, closing your eyes and just reciting the line. So you're kind of hitting it from three different areas, uh, physical and mental, and also uh, really just from your muscle memory. So I think that those are actually some pretty good tips I learned from Magic Camp. And, uh, and we'll get back to Magic Camp because I definitely want to get into that. Um, but with uh, you, you come back from Japan. Um, you're not yet Millionaire's Magician. Um, did you have a moniker at that point, a different one? I was the Hundred Heirs Magician. <laughs> Maybe 10, I'm not sure. <laughs> But you're, working, you're working in New York. You're doing some like Japanese translation stuff. I know also you were, you, you still continue to translate uh, for Tenyo, which has got to be, that's got to be like a very fun job just yeah, to receive props ahead of everybody. That's really fun. Actually, one of my favorite things over the past, I started in 1997. Uh, so, so Tenyo, if anyone who's watching this isn't familiar, are the plastic magic tricks that are made by a, a long standing company in Japan. Um, they are actually a jigsaw puzzle company, but they have a, the, the owner, the founder of the company years ago uh, had a, a affinity for magic. So he created a Japanese, uh, sorry, he created a magic division within the Japanese company, uh, which is dedicated to making very creative magic props out of plastic usually. Anyway, so, so in 1997, I was, in, I was asked by uh, Tenyo to become their translator and writer of all the Japanese instructions into English. And the reason for that was because the previous person who did my job was Gary Ouellette. Uh, Gary Ouellette didn't read Japanese, didn't speak Japanese, but he had a great sense of how to put down these ideas in a very clear way. So anyway, after he passed away, that job came to me. And fortunately, I'm, I know, that, Harrison, that you're big in Venn diagrams. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So, I'm maybe one of the very few people who sits in the middle of the Venn diagram of reads Japanese and understands how to perform magic. So uh, I was like the perfect guy. And I got the introduction actually through Mark Sitazukati, um, ah. who was, uh, was a great friend and, and also thought to uh, himself that I'd be the right guy for that job when Scary died. So uh, anyway, one of the beautiful thing of being the Tenyo translator is that I'm the first person outside of Japan every year, the first gaijin, uh, who gets the props to play with and work with before they are released. So as a kid, I used to love Tenyo tricks. And I told my parents to buy them for me for my birthday presents or for my Hanukkah gifts. Um, now I'm getting them sent to me and I got them before everybody else. So I feel like just the, you know, the best present I could possibly get. Plus it's a job. So uh, you know, for me, that's, that's also a thrill. Have you, that's you using your powers for good. Have you ever freaked out? Like, have you been at a Japanese restaurant and ordered in fluent Japanese and freaked out the waiters? I've done that many times, but it doesn't really freak them out as much as you'd think. You know, especially living in a city like New York, there's plenty of people who've learned the language, who learned, who've learned Japanese. Um, however, I have used it. I got, I, I shouldn't really tell this story, but I will. Um, I was asked by a company who was doing negotiations with a Japanese counterpart to sit in and pretend that I was one of them. Uh, and I was asked to listen in and um, basically eavesdrop on the Japanese uh, people who were sitting across the table to hear if they were actually saying stuff that would be influential to the negotiation that they weren't saying to us in English. So I just sat there and anytime they said something that was a little, you know, a little salacious. <laughs> and I, I wrote that note to myself and passed it over to, uh, to my boss. And uh, that, that, you know, I, very, very, there was very little to, to pass along, but I did do that job. I felt very dirty. <laughs> Never did it most of the stuff was just like, I am very hungry. Please wrap it up. And you're like, I, yeah, I, more like, I think you should order a main. <laughs> it's more like, I think her perfume is too strong or whatever it was, you know. Anyway. And I, I guess I want to go to that moment because what I love, so you, you were with Mark, uh, Mark Levy, uh, who's uh, one of your best friends. Um, you're sitting down with Mark and you guys come up with the idea of the, the millionaire's magician. Can you take us back to that moment and, and the decision-making that went into that? Sure. So I met Mark Levy. Mark Levy is one of the true geniuses that I, uh, in the world that anyone I've ever met. Um, people say there's actually a great quote that uh, his mind is like a computer 
um, but actually computers want to grow up to be like him. So, <laughs> anyway, um, so, so Mark called me up out of nowhere, and it was thanks to an introduction from Joel Bauer, um, who we both knew from Trade Show uh, Magic World. And um, anyway, so Joel told Mark, you got to meet this guy, Steve Cohen. I think you guys would really hit it off. So I got a phone call 21 years ago, um, out of the blue from this random guy. The phone call lasted about three hours, and we just totally hit it off. And uh, we haven't stopped talking this since. So we've probably talked every day for nearly 21 years. And um, anyway, early on, I told him I wanted to create this show that was going to be a Hofsenzer style magic show in New York City. And it had to be in a fancy spot. It had to be uh, very upscale, kind of an aspirational experience. People would have to get dressed up for. Uh, you wouldn't be wearing jeans and a t-shirt to come to see this. It would be more like going to the opera. And uh, we came up with the title Chamber Magic. And um, and I started doing the show. And it was, you know, it was very slowly taking off. But it was there were little bumps along the way. So I said to Mark, look, I need some sort of publicity stunt. What can we do, like David Blaine style, that would get a lot of attention and make a splash in the media, make people you know, take, sit up and take notice. And so Mark started interviewing me, even though he knew me, he was my friend. He interviewed me like he would interview one of his clients. And he's, he's a marketing positioning guy where he helps with um, like, you know, consultants and, and people who wanna write books and he helps them find their, their, their specific, specific uh, why. Like what, what, is, what is it that makes you tick? So he pulled that whole thing, his whole rigmarole on me. <laughs> and he started asking me all these questions. I'm like, Mark, you know the answers. He goes, just answer the questions. So he found out as he interviewed me that I grew up in Westchester County, went to school in Chappaqua, New York, which is a very wealthy uh, area, very wealthy enclave in Westchester. He found out that I performed very comfortably for uh, many millionaires and, and wealthy people in my town because that was kind of who I was surrounded by. Um, and he said, you know, he said to me afterwards that it's very Darwinian. You know, I had to get good really fast and if I wanted to keep up in that crowd. So that I, I agree with that. And then he said, okay, what else have you done? I'm like, well, I performed on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, for this CEO, for that CEO. Uh, a lot of my clients are people who perform, you know, they belong to country clubs and they're Hollywood uh, celebrities. He goes, stop right there. We've got to skip the entire idea of doing any sort of publicity stunt. We should just focus on your talents and make a moniker, something that you stand for. And just about a month or two prior to that whole conversation, I got a, a nice article in a magazine here in New York called Avenue Magazine, and they called me the Millionaire's Magician. That was the title of the article. <laughs> you to go all in on the Millionaire's Magician. You're going to call yourself that from now on. And I said, that is the most idiotic idea I've ever heard. <laughs> and I said that because I thought there's a lot of people who are not millionaires. They're not going to want to hire me. He says, well, that's, that's not, that's immaterial. He says, if you can't lose the $2,000 gigs, you'll never get the $20,000 gigs. And I was like, Hey, you know, you're probably right. That's, that's a, a good statement. And so anyway, I, I kept that in the back of my head and I asked my wife, what do you think about the millionaire's magician? And I'm probably wearing at the time, like a, like a Mickey Mouse T-shirt or a Sesame Street <laughs> T-shirt, you know. She's like, she's like, no, that's that's stupid, that's idiotic. And then I told my parents, and they're like, oh no, don't call yourself the Millionaire's Magician. You're gonna isolate yourself. You're, you're being too exclusionary. And um, Mark said, don't listen to your family. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. So I, <laughs> I listened to him, and I made a website. It was ChamberMagic.com, but the 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 uh, tagline it said, there you go. Uh, the tagline was the Millionaire's Magician entertainment for exclusive events. And I thought, this is never going to work. <laughs> and I was 100% wrong because uh, I went to London shortly after, brought the show to England, and did a whole bunch of media interviews, including the Richard and Judy show, which is kind of like the uh, Regis and Kathy show or Regis and Kelly show uh, of, of England. And uh, it was great because I was on the same broadcast as uh, Michael Palin from... Uh, yeah, from uh, Monty Python. So I got a chance to meet some really great you know, iconic people there. And they all were very intrigued by this millionaire's magician character who had traveled <laughs> all the way from New York. And I started getting lots and lots of press in all the newspapers, all the uh, television uh, broadcasts there, and BBC and, and whatnot. 
and and they called me the millionaire's magician because that was what I was portraying myself as. And sure enough, when I came back to New York, I suddenly was like Houdini's uh, phrase was Europe's eclipsing sensation. <laughs> I came back with all this reverse media, reverse press, and um, was suddenly uh, catapulted into being the millionaire's magician. I got this article in Forbes magazine. The photo that you're looking at right now was uh, taken by a great photographer, one of my good friends, Clay Patrick McBride. And if you're a magician watching this, you might recognize the last name McBride because Clay's brother uh, is Jeff McBride. Clay is a sensational photographer. Um, and in fact, we met, of all places, at Tannen's Magic Camp. Uh, Clay was also a great magician. Uh, no, he's, he understands magic like very few other people do, having grown up in uh, the same family as Jeff. And um, also, Clay is a magician with the camera because uh, you might have seen any of some of his work. And he's taken pictures of all the top rock and roll stars, hip hop stars. Uh, and he is, uh, I mean, we're talking people like, you know, Metallica and Jay Z and 50 Cent and all these the top, top people, um, people, the NBA stars. Uh, LeBron James. I mean, he's he's really he's at the top of the top of the photography world. I was fortunate to have lots of photos taken by uh, Clay for my next book. So uh, he's he's really someone I highly value in my life, but also someone who I met at Magic Camp. And we should mention that you have a new book coming out um, from Asseline uh, called Confounding Magic. Uh, that's close. You almost got it. Is confronting confronting magic. magic? There we go. <laughs> yeah, you're confounded in the title. I confounded exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to very quickly find that photo. I was like, I can do this. We have the book. <laughs> nice, nice work. Uh, yeah, that and that book is actually it's a coffee table book. Asseline puts out beautiful books. Um, if some of you are uh, familiar with the Tashin book that came out about magic several years back, with all the you know, the heavy book that you can get a hernia holding, um, <laughs> yeah. that that book um, you know is is a that publisher I should say, uh, Tashin is a competitor, but of equal quality of Asseline. Asseline makes beautiful and really gorgeous uh, art books. And my book is a coffee table book that's coming out in October. And I'm very excited about that. But a lot of the photography in that book, which I can tell you about later on, um, are pictures that Clay McBride have taken, some beautiful portraits. But there's also a lot of live action shots as well. And I, I so like what, deciding to be a millionaire's magician, there's a lot of people close to you. I mean, I know like your publicist, you mentioned your wife, who were saying this is not a good idea. When you did Chamber Magic, the first couple of years you were losing money, you were telling some people that you you weren't, but you were, you know, I, those are moments where I think some people would have probably just quit or stopped or said, okay, this isn't working. What yeah. what was driving you to stay the course? Because we know now in hindsight, it, se it seems obvious you like those were the right choices, but in the moment, it's gotta be really difficult to stick with them. So what pushed you through and, and let you, you know, stay that course? Yeah, well, I always knew when I get, when I got started, that I wanted the show to be a 20 year gig. That was just in the back of my head, is going to be a 20 year project. And I'm sure there'll be lots of ups and downs, but I'm going to get the 20 year mark under my belt. And the reason I picked that was completely out of, the, out of a hat. Um, I thought, you know, if, I could, if anyone could make it for 20 years in New York City, one of the most highly competitive uh, theater markets in the world, then that could be considered a success no matter who you are. So that was just in the back of my head. So anyway, um, I lied to my wife for the <laughs> first two years um, because we were losing money every single week. You know, there was no such thing as a hotel magic show. There was no such thing as a, uh, a close-up magic show that was a solo act in New York. Of course, you know, Monday Night Magic, it's been running for a little bit longer than, than me, but um, that's an ensemble show that, you know, that, that uh, runs one show a week. I was trying to do multiple shows a week as a solo act. And um, it was just financially a ruin. And um, I felt awful lying to my wife, but I knew in the back of my heart, in the back of my mind rather, that if I just stuck it out long enough, that maybe I could turn the tide. And it was purely just the gut instinct of, of wanting to persevere and see if, if I could make my 20 year goal a reality. And along the way, I, I uh, was super fortunate to meet up with a woman named Holly Peppy. Holly is one of my uh, dearest friends and she knows me better than anybody. And she said to me a great quote, which I've lived by. Um, she said, you can't push the river, you have to let it flow. 
And that's a really Buddhist way of viewing the world. It's actually, a, she told me, an African saying from an African poem. But um, she also said, you have to live life in real time. And I remember Mark also telling me the, the same thing. Mark Levy said, like, congratulations, you got an article in the New York Post. Wonderful. What's next? And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm in the New York Post. That's going to change everything. He goes, come on, that's just one article. That's nothing. What's next? And you know, these both of them, they kept on, you know, encouraging me and urging me to just keep moving and never to stop. And and uh, I just never gave up. That was really what the, the big secret to survival really is just never giving up. And and yeah, when you're in the midst of it, it feels scary. It's really scary, right? especially when you're lying to your wife. But suddenly there was a moment, there was a moment when it switched, it flipped. And suddenly I wasn't just breaking even. Uh, I was making serious money. And so that was a, that's a whole other story. Yeah, no, I think I've heard that advice before about uh, you can't uh, you, you can't stop the river. You can only go with the flow. I think that was uh, my dad's potty training advice, actually. Um, I think I think that's where I heard it. Um, um, but before we get to the, uh, we have some surprise guests. I also want to mention to the people who are watching live, there's a ton of you guys. Uh, please uh, keep sending questions. We're going to get to those questions. So if you have questions for Steve, please put those in the comments on YouTube or Facebook. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is interesting is you, you created the Millionaire's Magician. I believe when you originally created uh, him, you referred to him as in the third person. But do you find now, 20 years later, um, or at least 20 years of the show, but even longer, um, do you find there's more of an overlap uh, between who you are and, and, and the character? Yeah, I've, I've definitely grown into the character. In fact, my life has now uh, been overtaken by the character and in a good way and i'm not embarrassed or, or disappointed by that um in fact it's it's a great thing to aspire to to create a life that you want to live almost like a fictional character and then fill in all the gaps and that's what i've done so now you know where i used to be um the help and you know coming in through the back kitchen door to these mansions and and uh fancy venues where i was getting booked you know, now I'm seen as an equal in many cases because, you know, I've I've done very well. This has been a, a very lucrative, you know, career for me. Uh, but I've never I've taken everything in stride in stride. I'm not really, you know, never have a chip on my shoulder about all this. I still, I've I've grown into the character, um, but in many ways I still can't believe that that I've had this much success. But yeah, in the beginning, Mark and I used to call the millionaire's magician by the third in the third person saying, oh, the millionaire's magician would never do that kind of a trick or the millionaire's <laughs> magician would never say such a thing. And, and, and that's actually a good way to, to create a character. You know, it's to think of him or her as someone that you want to create and try to fill in all the backstory and try to fill in all the, round out all the sharp edges uh, so that you have this well-rounded character. So people are seeing you, that you're not pretending or putting on to be someone else and putting on airs. Um, you know, I think now when people are seeing me perform, they're seeing me because I've become that character in many ways. I love that. I mean, I, that was one of the, somebody asked me how I knew if I had developed a persona. And I said, I sometimes write a joke and I go, Harrison wouldn't do that joke. Yeah. And, and I would call I, another comic and say, I think I have a joke that works for you. Yeah, it's, it does, exactly. It's very disappointing. Sometimes you come up with or you find during your research a great trick. But part of the trick means you have to put things into your mouth, let's say. Right. And I'm like, well, you know, that's a great trick. But the millionaire's magician would never put items into his mouth in polite company. So um, right. that's just something I would never do. And now after Corona, no one will do that trick at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No kidding. But I want to uh, uh, go back a little bit because uh, we were talking about mentorship. We mentioned being mentored in Japan and working at the magic store there. Um, but in addition to magic camp, uh, were you also hanging out at like the cafeteria? I know there's always that group of guys that used to hang out on, like, I think it was like Saturdays or Sundays. Um, just kind of learning magic and, and sharing war stories. Yeah, so so um, the best way to think of it is Broadway Danny Rose. Uh, <laughs> because it was a whole bunch of old Jewish guys in the back of a Jewish uh, deli called Rubens on 38th and Madison. Um, now it's a, it's a diner. And uh, anyway, I used to go there on Saturdays. Not every Saturday because I didn't live in the city. I had to make a special trip in. But when I did go in, I used to hit Tannin's Magic first. And I would usually meet up with my best friend uh, in magic at the time, the uh, great Mark Sisher, who unfortunately passed away from, from cancer at a very young age. But Mark and I, when we were teenagers, would go to, uh, there is a picture of me and Mark and Harry Lorraine in the middle there. Um, 
anyway, so Mark was a sensational magician. And he actually was the one who introduced me to, to Harry. Um, and uh, I used to sit at, you know, at the table watching Harry Lorraine perform or watch at the other end of the cafeteria, uh, Frank Garcia perform or Ken Krenzel or whoever it was. There was, you know, visiting magicians would come in and, and uh, everyone would stop into the, they called it the cafeteria, but when I was there, it was the Jewish deli. You mentioned Harry Lorraine. I, we might as well get his word for it. Uh, welcome our first surprise guest, Harry Lorraine, everybody. This is Harry Lorraine's forehead. If you want to uh, <laughs> tilt the screen down just a little bit, there he is. Harry hey. Lorraine, how you doing? I'm fine. Konnichiwa. <laughs> how you doing, Harry? I'm doing the best I can, you know. Throw it off. What can I tell? But I'm doing the best I can. That's great. Well, you know, Harry, you and I have continued our conversation every Saturday. And that's one of the joys. Oh, there's a, there's an old picture of you and me and Dick Cavett. Well, oh, gosh, I didn't remember that. Now, how old were you then, Steve? I think I must have been around 13, 12, probably 12 at the time. Yeah. I think I see some acne. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't uh, seen, I haven't seen Dick uh, Cavett in a while. Yeah. He, um, Dick, I saw Dick actually at a premiere at the HBO headquarters uh, when this is pretty recently, within the past like six months or so. Um, Dick was had released a great documentary. Maybe you watched it of uh, him with Muhammad Ali. Uh huh. Yeah. Anyway, but you and I have been carrying on our conversations every Saturday, and for me, that's one of the great joys. I appreciate that a lot. I don't know if Harrison knows what we're talking about. We ha we haven't seen each other in a long time because of this. My word for it, the damn demic. Uh, you know, we haven't seen each other because Steve. And a fr another friend used to drive from New York to my home. I'm in Newburyport, Massachusetts. What is it, like a five-hour drive? It's a long drive. Yeah. And they come in and we spend the day and et cetera, et cetera, which was very nice. But because of this pandemic, we haven't done this, but we speak once a week for about an hour, I guess, or a half hour. Exactly. Well, my, anyway. my, favorite part is, my favorite part, Harry, is hearing you tell your stories about your career. And for me, that's... I mean, if anyone who's watching this hasn't read your book before I forget, uh, the uh, <laughs> it, it's a great, the best title, right? Hey, tell us, how do you get the title before I forget? You know, it's interesting. You know who said that? I'll drop a few names. Bell Brooks and Annie Bancroft, who are my closest friends, they kept saying that to me because we traveled together to Europe for 40 years every summer, for 40 years. And I would tell them some of the stories, you know, my background stories. And they always said, Harry, you got to write those down before you forget. They were making a joke. <laughs> oh, that's, how the, that's how the title came to be. Before exactly. I, you know, people have said to me that they start to read that book, uh, book, they go into bed and, you know, the way you usually do put on the bed uh, bedside lamp. And they said they couldn't put out the light. They had to finish the book, which is very nice. Yeah, it's it's really compelling. The stories are unbelievable. But you know, you being in in, uh, in the war and how you got out of fighting and and everything. I mean, it's really extraordinary. It's, you've lived oh, an extraordinary true. life. It's true. That's what you know. I didn't realize that, quite honestly, Steve. Until Mel and Annie kept telling me, "God, Harry, you really have to, you really do have to write those things down." When they said before you forget, they're kidding, of course, but they meant it. They said you got to write it down. Yeah, well, Harry, you know, one, one of the things I, I just wanted to bring to, to mind right now is that you and I right now are in, um, if we were in a magic square, you and I <laughs> would be in the opposite diagonal corners because do you know how old I am? I'm 49. And you're 94. Yeah, two over here. 49, 94. We're, we're the parody in the, the diagonal corners of a magic square. It's funny that you remember that because that's part when I do it, there are four diagonal corners, uh, two here, two here, two here, two here, you know. Uh, so, yeah, he's reminding me of the magic square. Yep, and I remember, remember also on your birthday when we did that big birthday celebration for you in New York City with 100 magicians who came in, one of the greatest, you know, one-day magic conventions that probably ever existed in New York City. Um, I was at that, on that day. I was forty-five, and you were ninety, meaning that you were double my age. So, exactly double your age. Can yeah, you believe? That? Amazing. But I have to say though that you know I've learned 
so much about magic from watching you perform. And I've tried to do my best in, in honoring you and when I do my own performances. Harry, he's talking to me right now. Uh, he was definitely just talking about me. And, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, but Harry, you know what? It's interesting because you've seen, you've known Steve since he was a kid. And I think sometimes you, I, you see a kid and you go, that kid has the thing. He, this is a, a star in the making. And sometimes you see a kid and you go, I don't know. But then they come back to you and you go, wow, he's really, really worked hard. And now, now he's on the path. Was Steve somebody that always struck you as somebody that was going to be as successful as he is? Um, and what were the things about him that you, you just knew that this was somebody who was going to make it? Oh, wait a minute, you know, my hearing and my eyes, growing old sucks, you know, I keep saying it. Uh, so I'm not sure, you want to know my background? Is that what you're asking? Oh, I want to know, when you met Steve, what, did you recognize anything in, in young oh, Steve? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I saw that in both Steve and Mark, because I always saw them together, he and Mark Sisha, who, as Steve said before, died, passed away too young. Uh, I, I wrote an article, I don't know if you ever published it, Steve, where I wrote about Mark and I called it Mark We Hardly Knew You, you know, because he died. A difficult for me to talk about it because he died so young, you know. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, they were, Steve is obviously a great magician, Mark was. They both contributed uh, stuff to my magazine at that time. We're going back to what, 1978, 1979, when they contributed uh, effects, magic effects to my magazine that I was publishing in those years for magicians. So yeah, I saw quite a bit in, uh, in, in Steve and Mark uh, immediately. Thanks, well, you know, both of us were like puppy dogs new, around you. So, <laughs> you know, we, we've always admired you all the way, all the way, every, every day. I mean, anytime that I, I came into Rubens to watch, you were the first person I wanted to see because I knew that you'd be holding court and you'd be <laughs> performing all of your classics like the, 10 card poker deal, the gambler, uh, 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 the, uh, the, 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 the card chop and the four gamblers. The card chop and the four gamblers. Uh, I had it backwards. Uh, you know, <laughs> we were just at your feet watching and learning and absorbing everything that you put out there. You know, it's interesting because you say these things, and you have that true. I, you know, what comes to mind, and I've written about this in the book that you, thank you, that you mentioned before I forget. I wrote about my background, and part of that was that I was the shyest kid in the world. I mean, I'm not making up those words in the world. I was the shyest kid ever. I got that from my mother, I guess. I mean, she was the kind of lady, if she was on a railroad track and a train was coming, she'd be too shy to yell help. <laughs> really, I, I was too shy in my little in my classrooms when I was a kid to raise my hand if I had to go to the bathroom. I mean, really, the shyest kid in the world. One of the reasons that magic is so important to me, Stephen Harrison, is that it took me out of that cage of shyness. Magic literally changed my life. That's and so Harry, do you think the fact that you were shy as a kid is the reason that you mentored these kids so much? Because I just think it's so awesome how you took these these just kids under your wing and really shared your knowledge and your experience? I, I, you know, it's hard for me to answer that. I just like them, you know. <laughs> that That's basically it. I like them. I like their talent. I, I, I like the two of them immediately. And I still, li I still like Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, yeah, right, so that magic, I think, was probably more important to me, guys, than it was to most people because, as I say, it, it changed my life. I was at the, I, when I was a kid, I'm talking about about 11 years old. Up until that time, I never made eye contact with anybody. I never spoke to anybody unless they spoke to me first. I mean, I was that kind of a shy kid. And as I say, the first card trick I ever saw changed my life. Because I remember seeing it and saying to myself, oh, my God, if only I could do that. Wow, <laughs> if I could do that, you know. And, like, hey, and, and you're the same guy who ended up being on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson 24 times. 24 times. Can you believe that? No, that, that was part of the story. You know, a lot of people don't believe it, that with my background, you know, I was a Johnny Carson, I think, once said, 
to Renee, my wife, may she rest in peace. And we were married for 66 and a half years. I went together for three and a half years. So we knew each other for 70 years, for God's sakes, and uh, loved each other for all those uh, all those years. And uh, I think it was Johnny Carson once said to her, or somebody said to her, Renee, tell us, what? how, how could you, what did you see in this D's, Dems, and Do's kid <laughs> on the Lower East Side of Manhattan? The ghetto, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, was only five, six inches tall. So he has no education, no money whatsoever. What the heck did you see in him? Her answer was his energy. I never realized that energy was that important. Yeah. You know? Well, you're, I have to say, if anyone who's watching this has not seen your L and L. Um, tapes or the DVDs, they are missing out because you that was you and your prime, Harry, and you were killing your energy. Those videos were phenomenal. Um, and 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 the engagement you had, and I mean, who wants to sit down and watch like you know 12 hours of, of card tricks, right? The audience, <laughs> said, oh, no, they wanted to watch 12 hours of you doing card tricks because Thank you, you brought so much energy to that room. I'm uh, getting you know. It's a, you know, thank you for mentioning that, Steve. This is about you, so, not me. But well, Harry, you, yeah, you, Harry is, uh, I, I'm sure there must be something, It's a, it must be a really wonderful feeling to see somebody that you've known since they were a kid be so successful. Was there like a moment where you saw him on stage where you're like, oh my God, he's really done it? Absolutely. I went to see his show at the Waldorf Astoria, which is now, where, where is it out? The Palace? Is that what it's called? Okay. Yes. Yeah. But, but, you know, you mentioned... An interesting thing, you know, one of the things that bothers me about that, you would never guess what bothers you about that. What bothers me is about that, that Louis Falanga, who died re re uh, recently, may rest in peace. He was the owner of LNL Publishing. He made these uh, videos of me to about 135 tricks, for God's sakes. <laughs> they are now in four volumes. But what bothered me is he called them the best ever. DVDs, and I am very careful about that. People have, you know, I told you about my shyness, and one of the ways I solved that problem is I overcompensated. I really did. I had to, you know, overcompensate. So now people yell, yell at me about my ego, you know. I told Lewis, I don't want to call it the best ever. He insisted. So what I insisted on and whenever I mention him, as I'm doing now, I put quotes around him. <laughs> I didn't make up that title. I'm not okay, that. I'm not gonna call myself the best ever. Well, you know, Harry, I'm gonna cut in and say I think that you are the best ever. <laughs> I 100 percent agree. This show. So thanks so much, Harry. I, I hope we can get you back on the show. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you can pick up all. Of, he has so many great things that uh, you can find on his website, Harry Lorraine Magic. Dot com. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe, stay well, and I hope we get to talk to you again soon. See you on Saturday. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, and one of the things he mentioned, uh, publishing your effects in uh, Apocalypse, um, one of the tricks that I learned at Magic Camp, and nobody told me who invented the trick, but one of my favorite tricks I learned at camp was the coin under watch. Right. Which turns out is a uh, Steve Cohen, Mark Sisher uh, original. That's right. So. So here's the the uh, the history of that trick. So one time at uh, the 4F convention, Factor's Finger Flicking Frolic, uh, Mark Sisher and I were there up in Cheektowaga, New York, and uh, this is back at the old Forks Hotel. And Gazzo was there, and Gazzo <laughs> um, came over to Mark and did something, and then loaded a coin underneath his watch. And it was just a gag. It was like it wasn't even part of a trick. And Mark thought, that's great. We need to do something with it. So Mark and I were always collaborating, coming up with new tricks. We were, you know, 17 years old, 16 years old. That's what you do when you're, you know, young and, and uh, exuberant about magic. So we came up with a three-phase trick where the coin disappears from your hand, goes to the other hand, then it disappears, goes underneath your own watch, and then eventually it reappears uh, under the spectator's watch. And that was something that we came up with. We had dozens of other... Uh, versions where your own watch disappears and ends up on the table. There's a picture of me and Mark. Um, so many different versions of that trick. 
But that uh, handling that we came up with was published in Apocalypse. And to that date, there has been no one who had done a, a routine around a coin underneath the watch other than just a gag that we saw Gazzo do. So yeah, in, in the history of magic now, I suppose that Mark and I came up with that uh, kind of iconic trick and other people have taken it and made it into a card under the watch, you know, a folded playing card, whether it's a, uh, a pre, you know, pre-folded card that's a duplicate or maybe even sometimes a signed card. There's, you know, there's been many different versions. And uh, Mark was your, I believe Mark was your roommate at, at Magic Camp. He's one of your bunkmates. We might have bunked together. I mean, I, I know that we were there the same year for, you know, four or five years together, but I don't know if we actually were ever in the same bunk. Who else, who else were you like rooming with at Magic Camp? Um, I know that Steve Barnes was one of the people at Magic Camp. Who I, Cause I believe this photo is actually in Steve's room. That's in, that's in Steve Barnes's room in Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah. And let's just confirm that we have Steve Barnes all the way from Los Angeles. How you doing, Steve? Hey, Harrison. Hey, Steve. Good to How see you, doing? buddy. Yeah, we, we were talking on the phone yesterday. Yes. <laughs> uh, unlike your Wisconsin pen pal, we've actually stayed in touch for 35 years. I know. That's amazing, right? <laughs> it, it, it's funny how we've stayed in touch so long. It's, it's really a great friendship. And um, I remember back in the day, you know, before any sort of digital, oh, there, there's a nice picture of us in Los Angeles last year uh, at the Waldorf Astoria in Beverly Hills. Uh, anyway, I remember that we used to send photocopies of of tricks that we um, <laughs> of tricks that we had we read in magic books, and um, and we'd send those tricks to each other as like you know printouts. So like, I still I, I have some of those. Yeah, you, you you know you had a book from a Larry Jennings book for example, and would take a picture of, of a Larry Jennings lecture note and send it to me by snail mail. Uh, that was a great way of of us being able to interchange information early on. Well, I met Steve in July of 1985. He uh, he was my first friend in magic. He's my oldest friend in magic. We've been friends for, for 35 years. And the thing that was interesting is uh, when I met him, it was two months before I auditioned for the Junior Society at the Magic Castle. So I didn't have a lot of experience with, you know, kids my age. So I didn't really know, you know, how good they were. I thought I was pretty good. <laughs> and then I went to magic camp at 14 and I met Cohen and I thought, you know, this kid's at just another level, you know, and here we, here we are 35 years later and this kid's still at another level. Um, but he was just, and the thing that was so amazing, because when you're 14, you know, kids could be mean, they could be jerks and they could be arrogant. And there were some of those at camp. Steve and I talked about some of those people yesterday. <laughs> But back then, and here we are, you know, both of us about to be 50, and Steve is just one of the good guys. He's always been, as we say, uh, a mensch. I'm sure we all know that word. But Steve's just always been very generous with, you know, his knowledge and his time. He's a good friend. Uh, he's generous in other ways. Um, Steve and I hung out in April in Vegas for the Johnny Thompson Memorial, and uh, Penn, and, uh, Penn and Teller announced it. You know, in lieu of donations, they wanted to give or start a foundation uh, in Johnny Thompson's name uh, for the Junior Society. And the first check, the first check and the biggest check that we received was from my dear friend, Steve Cohen. So just, just a, an amazing guy. And I love also that full circle thing of you being a kid, being mentored by some of the greats, and now you're running the program to teach those kids. Um, and if you are interested, uh, magiccastle.com slash junior-academy. They're on Instagram, follow Magic Castle Juniors. It's a fantastic program. There's lectures, they're doing stuff virtually. Um, Steve, do you have, did you, did I, Steve and Steve, did you guys get into any trouble at Magic Camp? Did we get any oh. trouble in that? I'm trying to remember. I don't think it was so. a long time ago. I, 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 will help, I will help refresh your memory. You guys okay. are pleading the fifth. I have one of my favorite people in the universe, camp director, magic camp director, Terry Cook, Mama Magic. Hi, guys. Oh, hi, Terry. Hey, yeah. We're well, we got Luke in the background. You have a special yes. bonus. That's wonderful. Wow. Okay. Um, I actually, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the interview, Steve, and talk about knives. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I, I, I can tell that story really fast. Um, so, so at, at Tannen's camp in the in the one of the contests, uh, I don't remember how old I was, but 
I actually um, was cutting open a racket ball, and uh, inside of the racket ball was supposed to be a folded up playing card that had disappeared somewhere else. So anyway, when I was cutting open the racket ball, I had a uh, a buck knife or a um, uh, just a a Swiss Army knife actually, and that's not a locking blade. It's it's a, you know it's a it's a non locking blade. So when I went to puncture the knife into the ball, the blade closed on my finger and got caught right in the middle. The blood starts gushing out and it's covering my close up mat with blood. Um, and uh, and then I, I kind of just went through the whole trick and finished up the whole thing. And I was trying to complete the act because it's a competition, right? It's a contest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just trying to pretend nothing's ever, nothing's going wrong. Right. And I think some of the people were like, wow, those special effects are really good. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, didn't, didn't yeah. Terry, didn't you patch them up? No. Uh, I, so, so what happened was Terry, you might've been there, but Belinda, Belinda, uh, I held oh, it, yeah. Belinda was there because she was an EMT and maybe she still yeah. is. And Belinda actually had some sutures and she was able to stitch me all together. And uh, I actually still have the stitches on my finger. If you'd like to see them, they're right there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, that's the day. That's the day that me and Vinny were on uh, midday live uh, with Bill Boggs representing Tannen's yeah. camp that day. <laughs> there you go. Here's it's the important question, though: Did you place in that competition? I think I won second place. All right. Yeah, something like that. You know, maybe maybe I would have gotten first if I didn't cut myself up. <laughs> well, the first year you did the coins through table, then table through table, right? The David Roth routine. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, but Terry, were you going to say that there was something naughty that I did or that Steve Barnes did? Is that why you were brought in to confirm or deny? <laughs> no, 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 no. Behavior after hours. You, you know what? <laughs> Cam, it doesn't, it that does not have that kind of tendency. That's right. So, well, I was always yeah. an Eagle Scout. You know, I was always like a legal Eagle, you know, trying to do everything by the book. Mm -hmm. I don't think I did anything off, you know, off the uh, record. So, yeah. No, we, we used to joke with parents. Our problem is we have to take, you know, the flashlights and the cards and the kids that are, you know, underneath their blankets you know, doing card tricks in the middle of the night. That's our problem. That's, true. That's really true. I remember that yeah. vividly. Yeah. Like you'd be like saying, Hey, have you seen this move? Have you seen that move? And, and, and then like, like four or five kids there. under the blanket, they'd have like a little blanky party going on and they'd be doing card tricks underneath. Yeah. There, I mean, there are honestly, there are tricks that I learned, you know, in 1985, 1986 from Steve Cohen, from Johnny Ace, from Eric DeCamps that is still in my, my, my go-to effects that I, you know, if someone hands me a deck of cards I'm doing stuff that I learned at Tannins 35 years ago, which which basically means I need new material. <laughs> yeah, you, got I I've seen you, you guys actually, the mid 80s and the late 80s, they had such strong kids and competitors and had great staff, Johnny Ace Palmer, you know, just they were very strong, powerful years. Yeah. And, we and had Thank you. We had Richard Sanders. Yeah. Um, Ace, thank you, Richard Sanders. Like, mm -hmm. you know, powerhouses from Canada. And um, Steve, is it true yeah. that Richard Kaufman may have taught you how to shave? No, that's backwards. Oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't teach him how to shave. What happened was Richard Kaufman used to live in the Upper East Side in Manhattan. And uh, uh, Mark Sisher and I were uh, teenagers. We went over to his house, to Richard's house. And, um, and Mark always used a electric razor like one of those like norelco you know <laughs> with, the, with the circular blades and richard said you can't shave with one of those you have to learn how a man shaves and so he took richard took the lather you know shaving cream put it all over mark's face and taught mark how to shave with a regular razor um, <laughs> i already knew how to shave because my dad taught me <laughs> <laughs> wow and uh, Terry, I don't want to get you in trouble, but because I know every parent will ask you this, but when you saw Steve, uh, both Steve's as kids, did you know pretty early on that these were people that were going to become full-time pros that were going to be as successful as they are? Uh, I knew Steve was going to be, I, I can't, I don't know Steve Barnes as well, but there was something special with Mr. Cohen for when he was young. We knew that things were going to go far and he just, he had a spark. He had something special and, and it was missed. And we were always curious those years that he was, you know, in Japan 
what was going to happen? What was he going to bring back with him? And, and he really, he brought a lot of good stuff back with him. He bought, you know, really matured his, his, his magic when he was there. So I was very impressed. I've always been very impressed. And I love when he comes and he spends time with the kids. The only thing is he forgets is he, Steve lost a bet at Tannen's camp and he promised me 10% of all his future uh, earnings. <laughs> I've got that written down somewhere yeah. on a napkin from the cafeteria. You know, you know that story, right? That story that is actually one that, that uh, David Copperfield said to Harry Lorraine. Oh, really? David Copperfield himself was a teenager. He wanted so badly to get one of his inventions uh, into a uh, into Tarbell 7 that Harry Lorraine was writing. And he said, Mr. Lorraine, Mr. Lorraine, if you would please put my trick in there, it would mean the world to me. I'll give you 10% of all my earnings. <laughs> and, and, you know, David Copperfield went on to becoming David Copperfield, right? And so... So his 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 earnings went up into the hundreds of millions, and and uh, Harry Lorraine is still waiting for his check. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, Steve, I'll be sending you some food stamps in a few weeks. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry and Steve, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. I love you guys so much. Mwah. Terry, oh, Gracie, thank, thank you, buddy. Guys. We'll talk to you thank soon. You. What a great surprise! Thank you for being Thanks, part of it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, oh, and Terry, by the way, did you want to share the the bathtub story before you go? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> love you. Bye. Okay, love you. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Actually, Harrison, do you know my bathtub story? What is your bathtub story? Okay, this is one of the one of my favorites. Um, so Harry Houdini's house uh, was up for sale a couple of years ago, and up in Harlem, 113th Street. And I, living in Manhattan, decided to go to the open house. So I went to the open house and I'm walking around in Houdini's actual brownstone and I'm walking around in his office, in his bedroom. And then I see downstairs a full antique bathtub. And I thought to myself, this is incredible. This is probably the bathtub where Houdini practiced his underwater breath holding. So anyway, I took a bunch of photos and I sent the picture, one of the pictures to David Copperfield. I said, hey, this is incredible. This is the actual bathtub. And Copperfield says to me, I want that for my collection. I want that bathtub. <laughs> and there's another one also. There's uh, some bookshelves that were on the, the, the uh, main floor. And he says, I want those bookshelves too. Can you help me get those for my collection? So I actually acted as his proxy and was able to broker this deal with the owner uh, who didn't want to sell it at first. But I'm like, look, you know, there's a good reason for it. Eventually got the deal uh, cleared. But then Copperfield called me up on FaceTime and he said, look, I need to make sure that that's the right bathtub, not the <laughs> small one, because there was a small bathtub that Bess Houdini used to use because she was so tiny. She actually had a small bathtub that was being used in the backyard as a planter with flowers. <laughs> so he said, would you do me a favor? Go to the Houdini house again. And would you lie down in Houdini's bathtub and take a picture of yourself? Just to make sure that it's the right size. He's like, I know how tall you are. You're a little bit taller than Houdini. So if you fit inside this tub, then that's the tub that I want. So I had to explain to the broker, excuse me, I need to go back to Houdini's house again and lie down in the tub before the deal is, is complete. And she's like, these are a bunch of wackos. <laughs> you know, who are these magician people with all these conditions? And so anyway, I lie down in, in the tub. I have some pictures, you know, a video of me lying in Houdini's tub. How many people can say that? And um, and then eventually the deal was made, and now the bookshelves and the bathtub are in Las Vegas in the collection of David Copperfield. And David is probably thinking to himself, wow, I can't believe I got him in that tub. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, uh, one, of the, one of the things I did when I was researching, I read, I tried to read every article and book, everything about you. One of the articles that I, I just love so much was an article about your show Chamber Magic by a comedy guy. And as a comedy, my, a comedy guy myself, um, I was, Super excited because um, he has been a writer for late night shows, politically incorrect. And uh, in the article, he mentioned that your show literally changed his life. So let's bring him on. Surprise! Another surprise guest. They're going to keep coming. It's Gabe Abelson, everybody. How you doing, Gabe? Hey, good. Hey, Harrison, Steve. How are hey, you? Gabe, how are you? I haven't seen you in ages. It's been a long... I'm sorry. I was almost late getting here. I was taking a bath with David Copperfield, but... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I've been okay. I've been good. 
<laughs> it's That's great to see you. Um, it's a little annoying that I, I first saw you 18 years ago and you look exactly the same. So wow, that's part of the magic, I guess. With a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of moisturizer. Moisturizer. By the, way, Adam Blumenthal, the, the owner of Tannins said, "Bess's tub is on its way to Tannins. Tell CB you're going to need another photo shoot." So I'm <laughs> passing along that message. Friends yeah, inside. <laughs> uh, but Gabe, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you were doing in your career before you saw his show, and then what that show did did to your career. Uh, well, I was a stand-up for 17 years, and it was something I'd wanted to do. I mean, like Steve, since I was a kid, and I got comedy albums, and I thought I was destined to do that. And I did do that for, made a good living 17 years. Uh, and then by a fluke of circumstances, I became the head monologue writer for David Letterman for five years. And um, then from there, after that, I got an offer from a show called Politically Incorrect that used to be on ABC. And the executive producer of that show was Steve Cohen's cousin. Exactly. And uh, a wonderful guy, Kevin Hamburger, a wonderful guy, great, great executive producer. And he and I shared a hobby of just magic. Which I knew maybe three tricks or whatever. And he said, you know, and we used to, uh, you know, just do stuff in his office, show each other stuff. And he said, you know, when you go to New York, he said, you know, you and your wife should really go see Steve Cohen show. My cousin is the millionaire's magician. And, you know, I knew, I knew nothing about magic. I said, great, this will be great. And we went and it was an unforgettable evening. I remember every single thing he did and where we sat. And, uh, but I'd never seen anyone do mentalism before. And as, you know, as, as incredible as the magic was and inexplicable, you know, all of it from start to finish, the, there was like a switch that turned on in my head when I saw him do some mentalism demonstrations. And then it became a passion of mine, a hobby. And I, Steve, it's been so long. I didn't even know, know if you know this, but about 10 years ago, I, I credit myself with creating my first career. I credit Steve Cohen with creating the second act, my second career, my oh. current career, really. I really do. Oh, because at a certain point, you know, as you age as a writer, there there's ageism in writing as there is in acting. And, and I thought, well, what else can I do? I, I've done stand-up forever. I can d go do that. But this is something I've always wanted to do on stage. So I took it to the stage and I've been doing far more mentalism shows in the last six or seven years around the world than I have been doing stand-up shows. And it's all because of you. I didn't know that about you, Gabe. That's so amazing. Congratulations. I'm really happy Thank to hear you. that. Thank you. I'm happy, I'm happy I was able to put you onto a path but of course, I'm sure that you, you know, brought all of your ingenuity into it because you're, as you mentioned, such a great writer. And a lot of mentalism really is just writing, but on the fly. Like you're writing. It's absolutely it true. It comes out oh, of your I, mouth, but it's, you know, you're writing, you're writing. It's the same process. You're just doing it in real time. A hundred percent. And when I started, I took gigs I had really no, no place in accepting, but relied on, because I'm using volunteers in every single demonstration, relied on my stand-up and improv background to make up for what I lacked sorely as a mentalist. Sure. <laughs> amazing, amazing. But have you, have you, did you stay in touch with any of the Letterman people at all after you left Letterman? Um, I've stayed in touch with a couple of them. Um, why? Have you? No, I mean, obviously, you know, he's oh. off the air. But I just, stay in touch a lot with uh, uh, with Jay Leno. We're still doing some work together. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, uh, yeah. You remember, you remember Eric Stangle and Justin Stangle, of course. Of course, Stangle brothers. Yeah. I went, I went to high school with the both of them, and Eric. That's was, right. Was, I had was, forgotten was, about that. That's right. right. Yeah. Geography is my favorite game. Uh, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> um, one of the things, by the way, Gabe, you mentioned because you obviously as a comic. Uh, coming up in New York and working all the clubs, you ran into you know your Chris Rocks and your Ray Romanos and your uh, and your Jerry Oh, uh, I think you mentioned that Steve Cohen stood out amongst that company. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean the uh, um, you know there's that and and, and uh, I, I apologize, I don't remember her name talking about that earlier. The head of the Magic Camp about that X factor Harry. that uh, Harry. had. Jerry had that Ray Romano had that uh, especially Eddie Murphy had maybe more, you know, than any of the other comics that I can think of. I mean, Eddie just, he just had it, you know, it just was powerful. And Steve had the same thing. I mean, it, it just, uh, and then I got to see him. Uh, uh, it was nice enough to invite me to a show in LA and I saw him again and it was, it was great. But of course, by that time when he was in LA, I knew some more about mentalism and in a way it was even more compelling to see how, you know, somebody that's that's brilliant at it, that's perfect at it, pulls it off, as opposed to somebody just trying. 
Um, it's a learning but, yeah. curve, right? I mean, you know, the funny thing about mentalism for me, because you know, part of if you haven't been to to my show, if maybe there's people watching this who haven't been uh, to the performance. It's people think it must just be a classical magic show, but you know, even Hofzinger, when Hofzinger and and Hofzinger was my inspiration for putting together a, a parlor show in the first place. Um, even Hofzinger ended his show with a book test. You know, he performed a book test at the end using poetry books. And so people would wow. open up a poetry book and, and put their finger on a verse and he'd be able to discern the verse that they were, had chosen randomly from a random book of poetry. So, you know, chamber magic has a, lo a large chunk of, of, uh, of mentalism. Part of it, it originally was a book test. And then and maybe when you came, it actually was a book test. But then later I changed that whole segment out to a Q&A act. So it's all, you know, questions and answers billet reading and that's the part that i think requires real artistry and being able to think on your toes and just like a comic it's like doing crowd work exactly exactly yeah no and that and that was it i'd never seen a magician who would i'd never seen mentalism until i saw you and it was what is this and you did pk uh, uh touch with uh, uh my wife and another woman up there and i was like right there in the front row and you did the feather and i was just mind blown I have to learn how to, how to do this. Yeah. Great. Okay, we are, we're nearing the end of our, our, our time. Um, so I want to make sure we have one more surprise guest. So I want to get him in. Um, but you all, I know as, as a professional comedy writer, Emmy award winning, um, that you have worked with comedians and magicians, they can get in Absolutely. touch with you through Twitter, Instagram, uh, Gableson, A-B-E-L-S-O-N. Make sure you get the E and the L in the right order. Um, Gabe, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. And I hope to uh, hang with you again soon. Absolutely. Sounds great. Steve, it's so great to see you again. And like thanks thanks so much for being part of this. It was a great surprise. Absolutely. Take care. Talk. Oh, I, I, I cut you off in the middle. Sorry about that. I just said talk to you soon. Good to see you. I heard my mom on a phone call where we called back three times before we had. <laughs> but thank you so much, Gabe. Bye. Thank you. Uh, and we, we keep talking about Chamber Magic, and we mentioned him at the beginning, and I think uh, – a full featured, full rounded interview would not be complete without this final surprise guest. Um, one of your best friends, the the co-conspirator and co-creator of Chamber Magic, it's Mark Levy, everybody. Come on. Hey. I'm the only one that you know. Know. everyone around. Did you uh, were you able to get David Copperfield Houdini's soap on a rope? No. <laughs> that's, uh, that's gonna be in the next Potter and Potter auction. <laughs> and you also said we've been on the phone every single day for the past 21 years, which is like 7,500 calls. Imagine if we had the, the forethought to have done like Mr. Wizard or every time. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm done. 70, I, 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 feel I feel terrible yeah. because All there's right. 7,500 cards that have not been found that we could have found <laughs> in that time. How would you have done it? What, what, uh, what method would you have done? Oh, it would have just been something like, you know, uh, it's like, may I speak with Mr. Wizard? <laughs> so the so counting I, one? I would, uh, with you, I would, have been, I would have done it differently. May I speak with Senor Wizard? Right. right. <laughs> Nothing would entertain me more if in the middle of Chamber of Magic, you picked up an old-timey phone and said, may I speak to Mr. Wizard? <laughs> right. Well, actually, you know, it's funny you say that, Harrison, because I, I actually at some point had thought of having one of those old phonograph um, devices with the big bell that comes out, you know, those, those, uh, large, bell. I just think that would be a great prop for my show because it fits the environment. Well, let's talk about your uh, building the show out. Cause I know you and Mark work together and your method for coming up with effects. I think it's similar to mine in that I, you guys start with ideas and sort of that, that die burning thing of what's the story the audience is going to tell. Is that correct? Right. If I may, Steve, can I, you've already had an hour and a half. <laughs> the next hour and a half is mine. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drink. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. It, it, Actually, it's by the way, Mark, I got a drink. I have a. Do you mind if I introduce uh, my my drink? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> We That's do actually a regular here. size bottle of champagne. Steve is just very small. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here in in my I'm in my hotel right now. I'm at the Lotte New York Palace, and um, the hotel reopened uh, about a week and a half ago. So I'm actually here in the palace right now, and I'm doing this show uh, in the private bar called Rarities, where they have all the most expensive liquor. Uh, I've got some Pappy Van Winkle bottles and uh, <laughs> some some Dom Perignon. So yeah, it's this is the, the well. Don't they, don't they serve a special drink in your honor in the bar? 
Yeah, they they created a drink called the Thinker Drink. And it's served in a kettle it's because served, it's in a kettle. In a kettle. It, it has a little bit of because of the fact that it's got a kettle motif. There's actually some, uh, although it's got a lot of booze in it. There's some some uh, bourbon and some gin and a muddled blackberry and some other delicious uh, uh, infusions. There's also an infusion of Earl Grey tea, which is actually a very nice touch. Oh wow! Yeah. If 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 David Roth were playing there, uh, his drink would be served in a bagless purse frame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, he just uh, your face. <laughs> I, right. So, so Mark, well, can you explain how we come up with with our. Um, oh yes, concepts? I forgot. Yes, so often, of course, you know, we have different methods for doing things, but very often it has to do with an image that comes to our minds. You know, it's it's. Um, so, for instance, there was a uh, a trick uh, that that Steve eventually got onto the cover of the B section of the New York Times, right, mm -hmm. and. The whole image of the trick, the, the, the failing, the failing New York Times, the failing New York Times, right, <laughs> right. And oh, so, God, the signal, the signal is breaking. I don't know what happened. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, where the trick first came from is when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I used to think that if you tossed a coin into a fountain if you tossed it in, in the exact right spot, your wish would be granted. Like in my mind, I just pick a spot. And if I got that spot, my wish would be granted. So I uh, like, I thought of that when I was like seven, 30 years later, 40 years later, when we needed to come up with a publicity stunt, I passed a fountain and I remembered that that was a very interesting idea. So we created uh, a publicity stunt for the New York Times. You want to uh, tell it, Steve, what sure. you did? Yes, yeah, so what happened so was- this was, Just before you tell, so this was based on imagery. Right. And that's how we came up with the trick. So go ahead. So what happened was the the reporter um, wanted me to do some magic for him. And so I said, why don't you meet me at the Hudson River at uh, sundown? Because that's when magic dreams can come true. So we get to the Hudson River and- um, I said, if you have a quarter, we'll use your quarter. Otherwise, we could use mine. I want you to initial the quarter on both sides. I want you to make a wish and write that wish on a piece of paper. Crumple that up. I want you to throw the piece of paper and the quarter into the Hudson River. So he, the, 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 the ball of paper didn't, it took a couple of tries, but the coin he was able to whip out and it went all the way out pretty far, further than the eye can see. And you see it go plunk into the, into the river. And then I said, you know, I think I may be able to read your mind. And I looked into his eyes and I told him that his wish was to uh, hike the Appalachian Trail. That was what he had written down. And he goes, yes, that's true. And I said, well, you know, if you had that lucky coin, then maybe your wish could have come true. But since you threw the lucky coin into the river, now it's gone. But maybe we can bring it back. And this is exactly how it looked. No exaggeration. Sometimes magicians exaggerate. This is exactly how it looked. I showed my hands empty. You took off your jacket. No, I kept my jacket. On. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was trying to embellish on it. All right. <laughs> no tickets to the gun show, Mark. <laughs> hands off the merch. Exactly. <laughs> I closed my hand into a fist. I turned it like this. And then water started dripping from my hand. Liquid water coming out. I said, that's the Hudson River coming out of my hand. And look, there it is, the coin you just threw into the river. And I opened up my hand. I was holding his initial signed coin. And I said, now you should keep this. And, and he kept it. I said, and hopefully that'll make your wish come true. Right. So it was the image of wishes coming through, of throwing it in the right spot, So, but from imagery. So that's one way we create uh, stuff. But another way uh, often is, is if, there, if Steve needs to perform for a specific celebrity or a specific newspaper or something like that, I'll think, okay, what is emblematic of that person, right? And so many a trick... That so if you've ever gone to if you've ever gone to chamber magic, you'll see a, a great trick there that Steve does called the map trick, 
right? And he holds up a map. And should I, should I, I want to explain where it came from. Should I say what the trick is or is that? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you should go into the whole trick, but you can explain sure. like why we came up with it. Right, right. So the, so they hold up, that's not a map. That's a violin. Oh, no, I'm just trying to show. Uh, oh, okay, gotcha. Things, All right, uh, gotcha. For, for, right. for custom people. Right. <laughs> so part of the trick in the show is holding up a map, and it has to do with thinking about a location on this map. But where it came up with is Steve had to perform about, this was like 10, like 15 years ago. I, I don't remember the exact time. But he said, I need to perform for Al Roker. And at the time, Al Roker was predominantly a weatherman. So I thought, okay, a weatherman stands in front of a map, essentially, and they they look at the weather formations and they talk about it. So you should hold up a map to Al Roker and have him imagine like a cloud going over the United States, going all over and move your eyes around and don't settle them any place and just in your mind, make the cloud settle over somewhere on the map. And Steve, Steve reveals it. Al Roker, he was never able, right? Tell tell everyone why you were never able to perform for Al Roker. Well, that was actually that was I was supposed to be on the Today Show, uh, the same week as 9/11. Oh no! Right. So it was 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. So that, right. that was actually canceled. So yeah. Right, was, but, yeah, but yeah. the idea was so good and the method was so good that we adapted it, and it's been in Chamber Magic now for 20 years. So it's often what's special about this person, what's special about this situation, and now how do we make something organic for who they are? So it's about their life. Yeah, I want to just jump in yeah. for a second. Uh, Harrison, you, you popped up a picture of me with my good friend Anne Sophie Mutter, the German violinist um, who I've been very close friends with for, for <laughs> over probably about 10 years or so now. Um, she had me do a special trick with a violin. Uh, that picture was actually me playing her Stradivarius, which is uh, not the violin I did this trick with, but uh, <laughs> I was in Switzerland and did a show for a bunch of top world-class musicians. I took a violin, I took a bow, and I started to play the violin, and I'm a horrible uh, violinist, so I started to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. <laughs> everyone was cringing, they're watching me thinking, this is horrible, and then I started to saw the bow back and forth, and suddenly there was a penetration effect because the hairs of the bow had penetrated through the strings of the violin and they were now permanently linked together. I gave that uh, that impossible object to Anne Sophie Mutter and she has it still in her house in Germany. I love that. I, I, and I love just the strength of, I feel like a lot of magicians buy the trick and then they figure out how do you jam it into your act? And you're starting with the idea and the story that you want the audience to tell and working from that point, which feels like a much stronger position. Well, it's kind of like what Max Molini used to do, right? Max Molini was creating these unbelievable stories and maybe had to work behind the scenes like a, you know, like a madman to make that actually work uh, in, in, re in real life. But, um, but there is a lot of legwork that happens beforehand to really make something special happen uh, during the show. And I believe you're, you know, you, Mark, Mark, uh, Max Molini is a uh, top of mind because um, you might be working on a special project. Well, well, yeah. Okay. What I what I had said, uh, um, Harrison had asked me, he said, uh, who were some surprise guests? And I said, you don't need any surprise guests whatsoever if you could get Max Molini on the program. <laughs> yeah, no That's what I, that was what I said. So yeah, yeah. Molini is yeah. my, my number one infatuation. Uh, yeah, there's a great picture that uh, that Juan Luis uh, Rubiales uh, made of me and, and Molini, which is really flattering. Um, <laughs> so so basically, uh, I've modeled much of my career off of Molini's life. And so during this pandemic, Mark, as you know, because I talked with you about this book almost every day, um, I've done a deep dive into Molini's life and have been working religiously now on a book that will be a biography. But it'll also encapsulate all the magic Molini ever performed in his career. So this is going to be coming out next year. But it's it's a really big project. You know, the only book that's been out about Molini's life up until now was the one that Di Vernon released with uh, Louis Ganson in 1962. That book was only 107 pages long. Right now, I'm I'm not even at the halfway point, and I'm already over 200 pages. So this book, and that's text only. Forget about all the illustrations and photos and memorabilia that's going to be included. So I think this book will probably be close to you know pushing 500 pages. It's going to be a pretty big uh, uh, volume that I think magicians will really appreciate because there's so many stories about Molini's life that we haven't heard. 
And one more story I'd like to get from your life, because this one, I, I heard it, I read about it, and I, I found it very touching and, and great. So you were on David Letterman. Uh, your appearance was fantastic. And I believe uh, you got very nervous before the performance, and Mark gave you some sort of game-changing advice. Well, Mark Mark has been, you know, in addition to my best friend, he's been like my spirit animal. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's like standing, you know, whenever I need help, support in any way, he's just always been there for me. I don't know. Maybe you're some sort of like an orangutan or something. I don't even know. Right. Right. Like you're, you know, you're like a water sloth. That's what I think. Right. Exactly. Um, but anyway, um, I was backstage and and my ears were burning hot, and and I remember going to the makeup room and she said to me, "Are your ears always so red?" And I had no idea what was she was talking about. It turns out I was so nervous that my ears were lit up like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, but it was my ears, not my nose. And so she put on, you know, some makeup on my ears. The makeup artist covered it up to look like it was normal. But I went back up to my dressing room and Mark looked at me. He's like, why are you so nervous? Why are you so worried? You've been on stage thousands of times. Well, and the thing you need to know about Steve, everyone listening to this is Steve. Like I had known Steve for like 10 years or more than he was like the coolest customer that you've ever seen. I've seen him perform for royalty. I've seen him perform for Stephen Sondheim. I've seen him perform... And it's like water off a duck's back, super cool. So this was the strangest thing that I'd ever seen. So go back to yeah, so Anyway, so I said, to, I, I, Mark looked at me like, what's wrong? Why are you so nervous? And I said, well, because everyone's going to be watching and, you know, they're, they're expecting greatness from me. This is going to live forever. And Mark said to me, well, actually, you have to think of it this way. When they booked you, but first he asked me, did they, did they send bookers to watch you? And I said, yeah, they came three times. And he said, well, if they've already come to see you perform live, then they only expect you to be as good as they know you already are, or else you wouldn't be here right now. And then you made a baseball analogy. Mark, can you explain the baseball analogy? Oh, what was my baseball? Start to explain it, and then I'll... You said something like, um, <laughs> like and I don't even remember the details of this part of it, but you said something like, you know, a baseball player, like when he's traded from one team to another, they don't expect him to suddenly bat better. When right, they, right, right, right. <laughs> when they eventually uh, trade him, like they expect him to bat at the at the art, you know, has at the the um, at his batting average that he had when he was being traded. You know that that was exactly what they expected from you today. So so you just told me go out there and do what you normally do with the same attitude. Then you said to me, "What's the first line you usually say in your in the opening of your show?" And I recited it because I've said it thousands of times. And you, you said, "Say it again." And I said, "Say it again." Say it again. And I said it again. And then he said, that's the same attitude you have to have when you go out and say the first line of this act. So that put me at ease when I went out there and, and, and it worked really well. Well, and another thing that I remember saying there, thank you for, for uh, sharing that. I didn't remember the baseball thing, but um, I said, when you did these shows for the bookers, were you at the very top of your game, the greatest that you've ever been or whatnot? And you said, well, no, I did good shows. And as a matter of fact, I think one show you didn't even know a booker was there. So you were there. And sometimes when you perform, like anyone would who's performed thousands of times, sometimes you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, even though you're doing some miracle like at the same time or whatnot. And I said, oh, so you didn't give perfect performances, right? You said, no. I said, OK, you don't have to give a perfect performance here. You know, they're not putting you on expecting you to be better than you are. You, that, you that's, the key right there. that's what you said. Like, they're not expecting you to, you to be any better than you've already proven yourself to be. Right. right. You, I, think the, I think what I've written down is you only have to be as good as you are. Right. There you right. go. Right. Which is fantastic advice because I know For I. For you, I, Harrison, though, I wouldn't give that advice. <laughs> like, you have to be, you gotta be way better. Like, Harrison, you got to work <laughs> at it, man. You got to leverage up your game, man. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, anytime I'm on a reality show, there it's, you, you have to worry. You're like, did they book me because they liked me? <laughs> right, right, right. I saw Harrison. Steve, you've always been raving about Harrison. And I didn't really, I apologize. I'm, 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 I, uh, you know, you've always been raving how amazing he is. And I watched some of these videos of him online. Man, you are so right. Oh, so right. funny. And just like, oh, that was uh, uh, um I don't know. I just wanted to get that in there that I'm now a huge oh, no, Harrison, no. I'm now a huge Harrison fan is all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> no, let, we can keep doing this forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as we wrap up, <laughs> uh, Mark, you, you've known C for a really, really long time. Is there 
because uh, I'm going to ask Steve in a second uh, what his advice is to young magicians. But is there anything that you've learned from working with Steve that you would pass on to any of the young magicians or entertainers who are watching? Is there any advice that I learned from Steve that I would pass on to? Well, um, or sort of learned yeah. in your collaborate, you know, in your working relationship together. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing, this may not be the world's most profound thing, but this is something I learned from Steve. And I'm a keynote speaker. So in other words, and I involve the audience a lot. So in other words, I perform a lot. It's just not, a, I'm not performing magic. I'm speaking about differentiation. And so, and I really learned this from Steve. Um, Steve, when he performs, he is a master at controlling the audience. It's, uh, again, this may not be, you know, like a lightning strike from heaven, but I always used to let the audience take control because I'm a nice guy. So I'd ask the audience a question and they'd start to answer and I'd let them go. And so Steve, like just like uh, from watching him so many times, he doesn't do it abruptly. People aren't upset or anything, but he's so like you stand there. Okay, that's enough. You know, like it was just, it's masterful the way he does it. So that actually influenced my performance style. So I, I don't know if that's a thing. So young people control your audience. Yeah. I don't know that that's <laughs> profound or something. No, that's awesome. Mark, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for all of your help. I really appreciate it. Make yeah. sure you follow Mark, uh, Levy Innovation, L-E-V-Y innovation.com. Make sure you check out all of his great stuff. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and Steve, before you give advice to the kids, I have a couple of other great photos of you as a kid magician, narrated by uh, somebody who's near and dear to both of us. So uh, here's a quick clip. Hey, Steve, here's 1986. Nice hat. Hey, Steve, here's you at Mostly Magic. Isn't that great? And here's you, yet again, convention time. And happy birthday to you from me, Brian. Uh, I mean, congratulations on being on Harrison's show. A huge thanks to Rabbi Brian. He, he couldn't be here in person, so he wanted to send that. Thank you, Brian. Uh, but I guess it, for the, the young entertainers who are watching, we ask this uh, of every guest uh, as the last question. Uh, what would be the advice that you'd give to these young magicians? Um, go out and perform as much as you can. Um, you know, now we're living in an unusual time where maybe that's more challenging and you don't want to bombard your parents with you know, the latest and greatest of your card slides. But, you know, think of ways to, maybe it's through YouTube or some other way of, you know, communicating with your friends, uh, but try to do as much magic as you possibly can because you really need to have the experience uh, that can't be gained any other way uh, than actual performance. You know, you can dream up these armchair presentations that would possibly work but you don't actually know until you listen to your audience. And, you know, I've created an entire show, an entire career um, that's done extremely well for me, you know, lucratively. But it's not, for me, it's not about the money. It's really just about listening to the audience and connecting. And that really just comes from, from watching the people's eyes. Are they still intrigued? Are they still interested? Or are they starting to veer? Um, are they uh, laughing at the jokes? Are they intrigued by the magic? You know, the magic shouldn't be... Uh, trivial. I think the ma you, any magic that you're doing, it might, imagine that this is the one, you're the one magician that this person might ever see. So should you be performing some latest and greatest thing that you just possibly worked out recently, or maybe show them something that you've done a hundred times? I would always go with the thing that you've done a hundred times, most likely because you're going to have a better presentation for it. Plus, most likely it means that you like the trick, right? You enjoy it. It, it connects with you in some way. And therefore, you can wrap some of your own personal life into the story and into the presentation. So, again, I'm kind of going off in different tangents, but come up with the most powerful magic that you can do. Don't compromise by minimizing or, or uh, trivializing the trick. Um, go for the jugular if you can. Something that's more imp the more impossible, the better. Uh, and at the same time, try to connect with the audience. I believe you, you've said this, but uh, you want to leave them, you want to leave their brains black and blue. Yeah, I, what I've said is that, and I got this actually from Mark, is I want to blow in the, blow a hole through the back of your head and leave black and blue marks on your brain. 
Oh, that is that is a fantastic goal. Um, and uh, let, if you want to follow Steve Cohen, uh, he has a book coming out. He ha is working on the Max Malini book. And also, I believe you might be starting some form of uh, outdoor shows based on the Chamber Magic experience. Yes, yeah, so that's something that we're working on um, right now behind the scenes. Once uh, the courtyard of this hotel, the Lotte New York Palace on Madison Avenue, uh, reopens, um, that'll trigger the fact that we can have outdoor gatherings. So... Um, what I'm, it's not going to be a large show. It'll be more like a close-up magic show. They're going to give me a table. People can book tickets to come and sit at the table with their own friends. It wouldn't be sitting with strangers. You'd be sitting with your friends. And um, booking time to spend uh, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour for a close-up magic show with me. And we'll do that up until it becomes uh, available to start doing the actual indoor shows again. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. I think Jeff Abbott just put this comment in. This is a great summary. The millionaire mensch. I think that is uh, your, that should be your moniker. You are a mensch. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate it. Stay safe, stay well, and hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. You bet. Thanks so much, Harrison. Take care. Thanks so much. Uh, a huge thanks to Steve Cohen. What an incredible interview. Uh, a huge thanks to all the surprise guests that we had. Harry Lorraine, the legend Harry Lorraine. You can go to harrylorrainemagic.com. Um, Mark Levy was our last guest. Levyinnovation.com. We had Gabe Abelson. That's Gableson, Twitter and Instagram. We had Steve Barnes. You can check out magiccastle.com says junior dash academy or I'll go on Instagram, Magic Castle Juniors. Huge thanks to Rabbi Brian, to uh, Mama Magic herself, Terry. Oh my God, I uh, love her so much. And of course to Steve Cohen, make sure you follow uh, chambermagic.com. There's all sorts of great merch, books, all sorts of amazing Steve Cohen memorabilia. You got to get that at chambermagic.com slash store. You can follow uh, him on Twitter and Instagram at chambermagic. This show is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, it's available on Apple Music. My Twitter is at Harrison Comedy. Huge thanks, as always, to the IBM. Join the IBM magician.org slash join the IBM slash join. Next week's guest is Rudy Kobe. I am very, very excited. So make sure you tune in next week for that as well. Thank you so much for watching from literally all around the world. Uh, it's an incredible audience tonight. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much uh, for supporting this show. My name is Harrison Greenbaum. This has been Who Books That? Who Books That with Harrison Greenbaum? I'm singing the theme song. That's my theme song, singing it.